And happy good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunday School. We are broadcasting live across these fruited plains and all of these seven seas Ooh. to bring you a question by question catechism of the book called To Be a Christian. You can get this on our website on the resource page of ChristTheRedeemerPA.com. And we're in the book To Be a Christian, edited by J.I. Packer and a bunch of really smart people giving us the fundamentals of the faith. So we're on question 132. I'm going to go ahead and pray and we're going to jump in. Blessed Spirit of the Lord, Mighty One of Israel, we ask for your grace and mercy that in your light we could see light. Show us as we study word and theology and the mind of the, of the church that you have given throughout the ages that we might come to know you. We want to experience what you have set forth as the blessed sacraments in the church, that we might have assurance to receive that which you so lovingly and freely give. In God's name we pray. Amen. So last couple weeks, we've been on the sacraments of the church. We looked at water baptism over the last couple weeks, and we're starting now with Holy Communion. And we looked last week at the idea that communion is this word together, common union or calm union. And we're, we're communing with Jesus as we receive the sacrament of the bread and the wine. So our our question, I didn't do a review question right now. We're just going to jump into question 132. Anybody want to read it? And then there's an accompanying scripture on your page there. The visible sign is bread and wine, which Christ commands us to receive. Yeah, yeah. So our question is, what is the outward and the visible sign? So the church uh, wants us to know about the bread and wine. That is the outward and the inward is the body and the blood. All right. Now, we've been talking over the last couple of weeks about how interpretation plays a vital role in how we live out our discipleship and live out our worship. And so, if Abby and I, or Mercy and I, were put on an island, the same Bible, they might come to a different conclusion if I'm on one end of the island and they're on the other end. And you might have heard that joke about the man who was stranded on the island and he was rescued. And when they came, they found three buildings. And they said, tell us, you're on this island by yourself. What are these three buildings? And he said, well, this one's my house and the one down there is my church. And they said, that's hysterical. You have three buildings. What's the third one? He said, oh, that's my old church. I left it and started this one. <laughs> Why? Because even there, he had different interpretations. And had a, I know, Arthur, that was bad. I'm sorry. Uh, but one of these issues that's divided the church, unfortunately, is the bread and the wine, and then the body and blood being received. Now, it's only been the last two, three hundred years that this has been really an issue. And so let's look now at 1 Corinthians 11, 23. Let's see what Scripture says the church interprets about the, the outward and the inward sign. Everybody there on your page? 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the comic books. Did you guys see that there in 1 Corinthians 11? Nope, nope. Okay, let me put, I'm going to put mine on as well so that we're... For I received from man what I delivered to you. Does anyone see that there? No. All right, I'm just checking. I believe it says, if I'm reading it correctly, and I have my glasses this week, because last week I blundered on Zach. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. Outward sign. Everyone see it? Bread? And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is given for you, inward, body, bread, body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup. Everyone see the cup, the wine. And after the supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is what we say here in our, in our catechism. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so the movement within the church for communion is take uh, I'm give a thing. Okay, sorry. Give thanks. Take break. Give. 
If you want to talk about a mission statement, there's a really good mission statement. Give thanks to God, take the body and blood, break it, and give it to other people. This is what we do spiritually. It's what we do physically. This is our lives. We're offering a thanksgiving of our own bodies, and then we're receiving his body, and then we're giving it to other people. Okay? So I want to make sure I was clear there. Who did Paul get this from? The Lord. The Lord. All right? Now, how do we interpret what the Lord gave us? We go to the ancient church. We go to the patristic church, those who were closest to the disciples. So one of the things this week I was struck by is how often we believe that the church started with zero knowledge. Okay? So what we think sort of happened is that on the birthday of the church, which what, what, what feast day is that? Pentecost. Pentecost, okay? So on Pentecost... All of a sudden, the church is born, and they have to figure it out because they started from nowhere. Now, ironically, this is not true. Where did they start from? What tradition did they, were they born from? What did they get grafted into? However you want to say it. What's the root of their faith? Oh, yeah, yeah. So is it any wonder that the pattern that they automatically start is very synagogue-like? They publicly read scripture, which is what we know they do in the synagogues. Then some rabbi or elder gets up, and what do they do? They expound on the scripture or preach on the scripture. They have elders, which is a very uh, 70 elders like we see with Moses. And then we're also going to see that there's going to be a Moses-like figure called the bishop or the apostles. Okay, so this idea then has to go with Eucharist. Whoops, I... With Eucharist, okay? So let's look, the Didache. The year is 70 to 90 AD. The word Eucharist is the word thanksgiving. This is what Jesus, in the Greek, when it says, I received from the Lord, that the Lord on the night he gave drinks, he gave thanks, right there in that scripture. That's Eucharista. He gave Eucharista. Okay, so the church labeled it that. And now I'm going to read part of the Didache. Now concerning the thanksgiving or the Eucharist, thus give thanks. First concerning the cup, all right? I don't have my thing up there. So we looked at the outward sign is the bread and the wine. All right. Paul said it. He got it from Jesus. So here they are, the early church. This is not in the Bible, but here it's their writings. First, concerning the cup. They have a cup. Everyone see it? We thank you, Father, for the holy vine of David, or wine, in which you've made known to us through Jesus, your servant. You be the glory forever. And concerning the broken bread. Check. We thank you, Father, for the life knowledge which you've made known to us through Jesus, your servant, to be the glory forever. Even as this broken bread was scattered over the hills and was gathered together and became one, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ. But let no one eat or drink of the Eucharist or the Thanksgiving, but those who have been what? Baptized. Baptized. So why do you think every service, what do I say? We welcome all baptize Christians to the table. This is where we get it from. Okay? Give not which is holy to the dogs if they're not. Okay, so this is early on, 70 to 90 AD. This is how they're interpreting it. Do you see there a memorial understanding where it has no effect? It's, quote, just a symbol. No. No, no. They're saying we give thanks, literal, right? And then we receive the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, what they're seeing here is a prophetic fulfillment of the book of Malachi. In the book of Malachi, they're quoting here, even as the broken bread was scattered over the hills and was gathered together and became one, so let your church. So Malachi talks about this scattering and what unifies them? The Eucharistic meal or the new covenant meal. This, this text from Malachi gets quoted a number of times in the Fathers. All right, who wants to read Irenaeus in 189? Zach? He took from among creation that which is bread and gave thanks, saying, This is my body. The cup likewise, which is from among the creation to which we belong, he confessed to be his blood. He taught the new sacrifice of the new covenant, of which Malachi, one of the twelve minor prophets, had signified beforehand. You do not do my will, says the Lord Almighty, and I will not accept a sacrifice at your hands. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is glorified among the Gentiles, 
and in every place incense is offered to my name and a pure sacrifice. For great is my name among the Gentiles, says the Lord Almighty. By these words he makes it plain that the former people will cease to make offerings to God, but that in every place sacrifice will be offered to him, and indeed a pure one, for his name is glorified among the Gentiles. Okay, so here's Irenaeus. And again, I gave a terrible paraphrase of the scattering. There, how, how is it that the Gentiles, who are scattered all over the place from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, they'll give this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, the Eucharistic meal. And he automatically says, it's bread, body, blood, wine. Okay, so Irenaeus in 189. Now, I don't want to bore you to death with quotes from the fathers because literally we could fill page after page after page of this. I want to encourage you that if you don't um, want to just take my two for the, uh, for the proof text, if you will, just Google Patristic Fathers view on the Eucharist. Okay? There's free websites. Um, and you can see what they're saying about Holy Communion, what they're saying about that baptism. What is the patristic father's view on Eucharist, on baptism, on the seven sacraments? And there's page after page after page quoting them. Now, again, I only offer that to you not because I want to be like, ha, gotcha. One of the things that we talk about in church history is tradition is the memory of of the Holy Spirit. So what did the Holy Spirit speak to Irenaeus? What did the Holy Spirit speak to, through the Didache? What did the Holy speak, her, Spirit speak to Polycarp? And so on and so forth. Well, he didn't change his mind. And if he was teaching them to interpret the body and blood that way, because that's how it was received from Jesus, we should honor tradition. Now there's two types of tradition. There is the tradition of man. Everyone stick your tongue at and go, that's it. That's what we're warned against, the traditions of men. Because Jesus teaches us that the traditions of men violate or choke out the word of God. So Corbin is the famous example that he gives that they were, there was a tradition among the Pharisees that you could give all your money to the temple and, of course, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and don't take care of your parents because that's, that's a better thing to do because you're giving your money, quote, to God. And Jesus said that's ridiculous. That, that tradition called Corbin, you were already commanded to take care of your mother and father. Don't nullify the word of God for the sake of your traditions. And that's where we stick our tongue at those and we go, get that out of here. But Paul says in 2 Second, Second Thessalonians, that I want you to follow the traditions that we handed down to you. So there is the second is the traditions of the apostles. Right here, okay? It's the memory of the Holy Spirit. And it's written down for us in this patristic period. And there is a ton of consensus. There's very few times that they argue and fight. Usually it's on practicality matters that eventually cold for a council, okay? And the council clears it up. There's also doctrinal issues, but I was sharing with someone recently about that. No one in the ancient church didn't believe that baptism was effective and was the entrance right into the church. They believed it so much that what they argued over is, should they withhold baptism because of sin? that it's so effective, so powerful, they're like, maybe we shouldn't do it because if we sin, we could be entering into very dangerous understandings. And so they wrestled it out. Babies, do we baptize them day one or day eight? Because we're fulfilling Jewish day eight circumcision, but now we're Christians, maybe we should do it right away. They, they don't argue what we argue over. Okay, so I wanna encourage you to study the fathers for yourself, and that's why I put them in the notes here. Okay, just simple Google searches. Before we go to the next question, which is 133, everybody understand the visible and the inward parts of the sacrament? Yes. The statement you have here, tradition is the memory of the Holy Spirit. Does that mean that he's reminding us? Or? Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. Which, which is one of the reasons in our, uh, in our services, I will repeat often, I mean, I, you guys are here every week, all right? And I know it must get annoying. But I just want to welcome all baptized Christians to the table. Why are we reiterating the same thing I say to you over every, every week? Because it's the memory of the Spirit. 
and we're shaped by what we repeat. We're shaped by what we repeat. It's why the liturgical, and this is what I was going to read to you. How do you know what an Anglican believes? Someone say it to me. Read the, Book of read the Book of Common Prayer. So each week on Wednesday and then each week on Sunday, I repeat the same prayers every single week. And so on Wednesdays when I um, celebrate the Eucharist at the table, so now, O most wonderful Father, in your great goodness, we ask you to bless and sanctify with your word and Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine, receiving them according to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, his holy institution in remembrance of his death, passion, and may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. Okay? So this is what we've been handed to us, and we repeat it. Zach? I wanted to add a comment. I won't read the whole section, but just as a reference to why we do that. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter... 11 as well, verses 27 through 31, Paul talks about that examination of our hearts. And he says that because there was an issue in the church of Corinth where people were getting sick from eating yeah. the Lord's Supper out of not showing reverence or doing it properly. So when we do that practice and we say those prayers, it's also a reminder to us that we are preparing ourselves to be in good standing coming to the Lord's Supper lest we inflict judgment upon ourselves. Yeah, that scripture specifically was the, one of the turning points for me as I began to embrace a sacramental view more than a memorial view. If it's just a memorial view, how is it that people were getting sick and dying among them? That's the one that I was like, I don't get it. It's so, quote, powerful that some are getting sick and dying because they're not in right relationship, Zach, as you pointed out, with God or they're not discerning the body correctly. But I'm just saying it's something we do as a, like a, a mere memory with no effective power. But Paul didn't say it that way. He was warning them, you better get right. You could get sick and die from this. That seemed pretty effective to me. So that's when I began to this, you know, change very slowly, but I began to change. Good, good. Any, anybody else? Questions, comments, thoughts on that? No? All right, let's look at 133. I'll uh, read the question and then someone to give me the answer. What is the inward gift signified? Turn your page over. What is the inward gift signified? It's on 54, top of page 54, the answer. Libby? The inward gift signified is the body and blood of Christ, which are truly taken and received in the, the Lord's Supper by faith. That's right. The inward gift signified is the body and blood of Christ, which are truly, truly taken and received in the Lord's Supper by faith. So um, we're going to look at a progression that our, um, our catechism gives us, starting with Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 3. We're going to see how this in Scripture helps us understand that we're truly taking and receiving the Lord's Supper by faith. Okay, so Deuteronomy 8. The whole commandment that I have commanded you today shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you what is in your heart. And he humbled you and let you hunger and feed on manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, so here's the precedence within Old Testament understanding. We have manna. Now, in the Old Testament, what is the single question we should be continually asking ourselves when we read the Old Testament? You've heard me repeat this, but I'll repeat it again because I like saying it. What's the one question we always ask reading the Old Testament? Where's Jesus? Ah, yes, yes. Where is Jesus? What does this have to do with Jesus? This is a part of the apostolic tradition. They're reading the Old Testament, and you know what? They preach the gospel from it. Your epistles are full of them going, hey, this is what Joel meant. As you see the Spirit being poured out, this is what he meant, because Jesus has been ascended. <gasps> You know what? By his stripes. Whose stripes? Jesus' stripes. You can be healed. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Okay, so that's what we're asking. So here we are talking about manna. And we're asking that question. What does manna have to do with Jesus? Well, you know, it's funny. Jesus answers that question. He didn't come to my class. He made all this up, not me. All right, John 6. Our fathers 
ate what? Manna. They ate manna. This is where our ears go, huh? What, what's it? In the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you. Now, truly, truly in the Greek is amin, amin. And this is how covenants are started. When we swear on oaths in the courtrooms, we lay our hands on them and I say what? I solemnly swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me. So help me God. Jesus is starting covenant language when he says, I mean, I mean, truly, truly, I swear to you, I tell you. And since there's no one greater to swear by, who does he swear by? Himself, Hebrews tells us. It's covenant language. I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven. I don't know if everybody would have had like a brain sneeze there. Like, what? Deuteronomy said it. Uh, but let me interpret for you. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Hallelujah. I don't know if there was Handel's Messiah started going off. Now, Paul tells us in Colossians 2 that the OT is a shadow of what? The NT. The NT, very good. Not NT right though, even though NT right. I'm bad. Love we do love him. Is a shadow of the NT or Christ. So here it was, the shadow usually proceeds. If the sun comes in behind me, my shadow comes first. And of course, rippling muscles, like that whole thing, right? And then it comes, Pedro, you know what I'm talking about, all right? And it comes in. And then the expectancy is not to talk with my shadow, but to talk with me. And so the manna is that shadow. And then Jesus says, literally, I am the bread that has come down from heaven from my heavenly father. And so look in verse 34. Sir, give us some of this bread. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. So the Jews grumbled because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread will, I will give is the life of the world. So if we feed on Christ by faith all the time, is it any wonder he would give us a physical covenant meal to do it so that the sacrament can be assured to us? This is what I always, I, we have an assurance People question this all the time. When I was first uh, uh, following the Lord, I used to go do the sinner's prayer nine, ten times. I'd go down to the altar because I had no assurance. My little heart was like, oh, I sinned this week. I must be dead. God's going to kill me. Okay? I needed assurance. So the only sacrament we had in the evangelical church was the sinner's prayer. So I would run down to the altar, and I believe there at that physical place, I would receive the spiritual reality of fresh and the new. And Jesus said, how about I give you bread and wine, which is what I've set up as the covenant meal to give you assurance every week that you're actually one with me, that I nourish you, that I feed you, that we can relive the gospel message and you can have fresh blood applied to you. And so what does 1 Corinthians 10 say? For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed to the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. You see some interpretation happening here? They didn't know this. He's telling them. Moses actually gave them a baptism. And they all ate the same what? What did they eat in verse 3? What kind of food was it? Spiritual food. Now, what do Anglicans believe? Where do we find out what they believe? All right, so let's find out. Do we, do we take this kind of language and put it into scripture form to pray it back to God? Well, at the end of every uh, Eucharistic, we have a um, post-communion prayer. And in the post-communion prayer, we all say, Heavenly Father, thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food, amen, of the most precious body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that, that's so cool. It's like someone thought this through, okay? That's what liturgy is. I'm going to do a podcast on this really soon, okay? It's very intentional, all right? And all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock. Now, wait a second, Paul. Are you telling me water flowing from a rock, which is mind-blowing, by the way, it, there was a shadow, the manna was a shadow, the rock is a shadow, and it's, it's who? Who is the rock that the water came from? Christ. It's Christ. Now look, right from there, in context, I wanted you to see that I wasn't making it up. That's verse 4, verse 16, for the cup we bless, is it not the participation of the what? The blood of Christ. 
So now we have true drink, don't we? Paul said that that water that flowed from that rock was actually Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, that was a physical, representing a spiritual, that was to literally keep them alive. And now he says, here's the covenant meal. I want to keep you alive. I want to nourish you. I want to be in union with you. I want to relive the covenant again and again and again and again with you. Is it not the participation of the blood of Christ? The bread, the, blood, the bread that we break, is it not the participation of the body of Christ? All right. That's why our catechism gives this progression from Deuteronomy to John the 1 Corinthians. Because it didn't come from nowhere. They weren't born again into this like, oh, cool, we started a church. Hey, what do you think we should do every week when we get it together? And man, is there any way God would actually assure us that he's going to show up? It all came from somewhere. Except now it's fulfilled. All right? Questions and comments before we read Ignatius of Antioch. <laughs> Zach? I, um, I love, well, I mean, I love the sacrament of communion, but, but even interestingly, you know, we go back to the Book of Common Prayer, and we know in church history, Calvin did help Cranmer with that. And I was just kind of looking at his institutions of the faith, and he talks about pious souls, meaning that those in prayer... I'm just going to paraphrase it because he wrote without lucid brevity. But essentially, in our prayer and in our faith, we can come to that sacrament. Amen. And we know we are receiving the body and blood of Christ. Yes, which is why in our sacrament, I mean in our catechism, it says that it is truly taken and received the Lord's Supper by faith. By faith. And so we're, we're coming to that table believing. We're not coming to exercise in some mundane ritualism that we do not believe. And so we're calling to believe. Now, faith comes by hearing. Hearing. Why does Cramner, when I say every week after the absolution, here's the word of God to all who truly turn to him and then I give you scripture. Why? Because I want you to believe you can be forgiven based on the word of God. Why do we use the words of institution every single week? Jesus, on the night of he was betrayed, I go through the, why? Because I'm calling you to faith. I want you to believe, because he said it. He did it. Okay, so you can come to the table by faith. Glenn. Cloud cloud my thinking. Okay. What are you saying exactly? I mean, are you talking about a physical church, an institution, saying one thing, but not in reality what the Scripture is teaching? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Um, when we use the word institute, think of it as this is the, uh, the, what we're supposed to do. So when we have an institution, it is a, um, a physical place. But when we institute something and we're commanding, it becomes the precedence. It becomes by what we should do every time we gather together. Um, so um, when one institutes something, it's to be repeated. It's not to be objected. So the words of institution are when Zach said that uh, Calvin um, was working with Cramner on this, he was a former Roman Catholic priest. And so as, yeah, so as, as a priest, he would have known from church history, every time they gathered together with the Lord's Supper, they would have used these words that Jesus said. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and gave thanks. This is the cup. They would have used it. And so it was an instituted thing within both the church proper, and as a as a command or a verb. Okay. Well, I, I guess where I missed it is I never knew that there was an issue in the church because in my, uh, I call it in my religious background, you know, you always accepted that as the body and blood of Christ. There wasn't, there wasn't a question about that. But yeah. That, it's a large, it's a large standing debate right now, and I'll, I'll explain here. As a priest, when I come to the table to celebrate Holy Communion, I don't get to do what feels good to me. I get to do what's given to me by the Lord, right? We read that from 1 Corinthians 11, which is what the Lord has given to me, and what the church has interpreted as proper. So when I come to the table, if um, in my evangelical background, when I was not a priest, and I was just a uh, typical or, or more common name uh, Protestant minister, I could have crackers and juice and not repeat what was listed there as the Lord saying these things. I could just get up, okay guys, we're going to pray right now. Lord, thank you for the bread and the wine. We thank you for dying for us. Um, help us to discern you rightly. If there's any area of our life that uh, we are in sin, please forgive us. 
everyone say amen and they would say amen okay let us now eat the crackers and, the, and, and drink the grape juice and that would have been a very common communion type situation in those circles because yeah. you, you would hear you know uh, this is a symbol Yes, exactly. You know, as they were presenting the yes. sacrament, you know. Yeah, okay. and I wasn't saying that to mock. Again, I, I, I was in that sort of sh uh, stream for many years, and that, that's why I repeated it, because that's very similar to how I did it. Okay. Okay, and so one of the things that's important here, all right? All right, I'm going to try to say this very sensitively. When we come to the Lord's table or sacraments, a general, there are words that we say for it to be a valid experience. I'll give you an example. Two people are about to get married, but they don't say something like this. They don't say, I take you, Angie in my case, to be my lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold, for richer or poorer, for sickness and in health, until death do us part. Amen. She repeats back the same thing. If I don't say that and I'm like, babe, I take you. She says, babe, I take you. Are we married? Now, here's what the church would say. Do you want assurance that you're really married in sickness and in health? Because if I say, babe, I have you, and then one day I get really sick, and she says, well, I didn't sign up for that. I didn't sign up to be your husband in the babe, I take you. I thought you'd be healthy this whole time. I kind of don't like you like in this state. I'm done. And I wish that, like, Mike, that's petty. This happens all the time. Someone loses their job. Somebody gets older and a newer, shinier version of a spouse comes along. If we don't have words that have impactful language that the church has addressed through scripture, and it's possible that the marriage is good, but this is why we use in the 39 articles the word assurance. It's our assurance that when I repeat those words and I say, this is my body. This is my blood. You know what you're coming to receive. You guys understand what I mean? So do I believe that there could be a marriage in that case when someone says, babe, I take you, babe, you take me? Of course. But I don't know about you, but I'm looking for some assurance that through sickness and in health and through death do us part, that we would be able to be in union in that way. This is why the words matter. Does that make sense? This is why the liturgy matters. And what, we, what could be held as a sort of, um, oh, you're just being so technical. You're being so rigid. You're being so ritualistic. Well, yeah, it's important, right? All, all that important. Now, if I don't have faith, if I'm not looking to receive in expectancy what he promised, of course we can get in trouble. But I, I, want, all, I want the whole package. Give me the whole thing. Okay, does, does that make sense why when I said the word institution is the reason why I was saying that? That the, it's not as though in a Protestant community that the communion that people are receiving, God couldn't bless hearts and souls that way. But the church has said, I want to give you assurance. And the assurance comes through the liturgy by faith because it's embodied in Scripture. Okay, and, and the words matter. I think it's something like, I was just listening to Scott Hahn talk about this in a book. I think it's like something 32 times Jesus in um, the Gospel of John keeps repeating the word truly, truly, or I mean, I mean, I mean. I'm like, why? Because he's talking covenant language. That's how covenant contracts start. Again, we do this very similarly in our culture. And it's not weird, again, if a judge walks in with a robe and we all stand up. And then we all do oaths. And we put symbols and signs and put our hands on there. And if you violate the oath that you take, it's called perjury. You get to go to jail. It's not just symbolic. Look, well, I didn't, it doesn't mean anything. He's like, well, you bet your skippers it does. They pull up that little piece of paper from the dude or dudette that's typing. Like, you said that you swore to tell the truth and you didn't tell the truth. Perjury, jail. <sighs> All right. So Jesus, truly, truly, I mean, I mean, take my words, covenant me in you. Blessing and curses. All right. Um, before we read Ignatius, any, anybody else? Questions, comments, thoughts? No? All right, so let's read Ignatius and see if the early church, this is 110. Ignatius is probably a disciple of the Apostle Peter, okay? Or, or very close, all right? Anybody want to read Ignatius? All right, Paul. 
Make certain, therefore, that you all observe one common Eucharist, for there is but one body of our Lord Jesus Christ, and but one cup of union with his blood, and one single altar of sacrifice, even as there is also but one bishop, with his clergy and my own fellow servitors, the deacons. This will ensure that all your doings are in full accord with the will of God. Damn! Wow! Wow! All right. He just called out the will of God card. You know how everyone's searching for the will of God, right? They're like, I want to be in God's will. I want to be in God's will. What, what kinds of things did you see are in God's will? Let's, let's start in that first sentence. Make certain, therefore, that you observe what? Common One common Eucharist. For there is but how many bodies? One body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how many cups? One cup. How many altars of sacrifice? One. One. How many bishops? One. One. Now, all of that's the will of God, according to Ignatius. Are you catching that? This is what we should be doing when we gather together. It's 110. Where did he get the idea from? I... Again, not being there, we do know from church history, he's probably, he got it from Peter, okay? So as early as 110, John dies between 95 and 99 or 100. And so 10 years later, this is what they're writing. What does he mean by one bishop? Yes, yes, very good. Yes. Um, there's going to be two good answers, and I accept both. Who is the single bishop that we are told is the overseer of the church, according to 1 Peter? Jesus. Jesus. He is the episkopos. Okay? Every city then for, after apostolic succession, how many bishops did they have in the city? One. One. So the clearest example from Scripture is Timothy. The pastoral epistles are not the pastoral epistles. Church history tells us that Timothy is the bishop of Ephesus. And when I say bishop, it came with all the things we understand. He was the guy in charge, and then he ordained the other priests or elders in the city in his stead when he cannot be there. And so he is the one bishop. And so Ignatius is going to be very pointed that if you do not have the bishop, you are not on the will of God. I have a question mm -hmm. for history. Is, is it true that the bishop was the one who consecrated the Eucharist and then pa was passed out to the priest then to celebrate? Mm -hmm. was, it, was that an historical fact? In our liturgies, you'll read them that the bishop is always the main celebrant. So I get my right to be a celebrant by extension of the bishop. So I serve at his behest to do the work of the ministry. So technically, what we always say is bishop is actually the head of this church. I mean, Jesus, of course, right? Okay, I'm not. I serve on behalf of bishop. So anytime bishop comes, I always give deference to bishop in apostolic succession. So when bishop comes, I check my liturgies with him. Bishop, is this what you want to do? Bishop, is this okay? This is what we're doing. And then, Bishop, what do you want to do when you come to the table? How can I serve you? Because he is the main celebrant in church history. And the idea is that he's in the seat of the apostles. And so the seat of the apostles are the extension of Jesus. He gave them the right to sit on the 12 seats judging the tribes of Israel. We can say this a bunch of different ways. To forgive sins, to bind sins, to uh, celebrate at the table and to perform the sacrament. So if we were doing baptism, Bishop gets to baptize unless he says, no, Mike, you do it. I said, yes, sir. Okay. Good, good. And anybody else? All right, so again, my, um, let me see what time it is here. What I'm gonna encourage you with um, is this concept of receiving and truly taking the Lord's Supper by faith, the body and blood, an encouragement to Google the Patristic Fathers, and, and your homework, if you should dare to do it, I want you to read the sacramental liturgies given within the BCP, okay? Inside of the Book of Common Prayer 2019, um, I wanna encourage you to read them slowly, and then as you're reading them slowly, look how many of them are scriptures put into prayer form, or what we call rites into those forms. And so when we think of rights, don't get the heebie-jeebies. We have rights for many things for people who are doing official capacities. When soldiers get sworn in, do you know what they do? They do a right in which they say, I swear to uphold the Constitution. You were in the military. Uh, right? 
Um, and so and when we have soldiers and judges and politicians, we have rites and ceremonies. And in those rites and ceremonies are words. And so here, because we're trying to do something extremely important, I want you to read these liturgies. Okay, they're called the pastoral rites, and I want you to be familiar with them. Arthur. Page they start on? Yeah. So Holy Communion starts on page 110. Oh, I lied, Arthur. Forgive me. 105. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yep. And then in the, uh, in the pastoral rites, so this is going to be the other sacraments on page 161 starts um, holy, uh, holy Baptism. And it goes through page 249. So how our BCP reads is Holy Baptism, Confirmation, Reception, Reaffirmation, Baptism with confirmation, renewal of baptismal vows, holy matrimony. Oh man, we need some weddings. Glory! Thanksgiving for birth or adoption of a child, the rites of healing, the reconciliation of the penitent, ministry to the sick, communion of the sick, additional prayers for the sick, ministry to the dying, barriers, prayers for the vigil, and burial of the dead. So 161 to 249. And then it's 106. And then you can see there's two liturgies given to us for Holy Communion. <clears throat> and that will give you a very, very good understanding of where the church present here in the Anglican Communion is trying to be faithful to the apostolic tradition. Glenn, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Just to clarify something for me, because in the conversations that I've had previously with people regarding, you know, being a baptized Christian and receiving Eucharist. Uh, so the resource that we use traditionally is from the Didache. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Yeah. It's not exclusive, but that's one of the earliest and most clear. Okay. Yeah. It's, you, know, it, it, you know, it's been argued that, well, the Bible isn't real specific about that. but Yes. So it, it then progresses. So by right around 300, um, there's this guy named Hippolytus of Rome. He is the bishop of Rome. And there are... Uh, so it's pre-Nicaea and it's pre-Constantine. So the church has got literal traitors in it. There's people there that are getting paid to spy out Christians and turn over Christians. And there's those who are serious pagans who want to come into the faith. So they had two parts of their service called the ministry of the word and the ministry of the table. If you were a seeker, right, you're like, oh man, Mercy's an awesome Christian. I'm thinking about becoming a Christian. What's this like? I could go sit in the church service during the ministry of the word. I could hear the scripture read, I can hear the sermon, I can maybe even, I don't know, where the, the prayers of the people always would have laid, okay? But as soon as Holy Communion happened, one of two things. They had to get up and go out, which was the common thing. They were not allowed to be at the table. Of course, they, were, they could not come to the table because they were not baptized. And the progression is, baptism always had communion right afterwards. So the first thing that those who are freshly baptized they used the concept of coming into the land of promise. This is the milk and honey. And so with the whole church gathered, they can receive the bread and the wine right after baptism. And so it, it has this full progression. Later on, then, we could get into some uh, greater issues of, uh, I think, the more pastoral concerns. Good, good. Any, anybody else? Questions, comments, thoughts? We're about wrapped up. Zach. I thought to uh, close, I'd just read one little snippet from Calvin's Institutes on the Lord's Supper in regards to what Christ said to his apostles. He, he says here briefly, For these are words which can never lie nor deceive. Take, eat, drink. This is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Amen. 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 Yeah, Arthur. The uh, references to the church fathers, mm -hmm. are they in the uh, book To Be a Christian, or is this your own study? No, this is my own study. Thank you for saying that. I meant to say that because we're, when we're, we're recording. I put these here for you guys as a reference, but they are not inside the a Anglican Catechism. Occasionally, they will reference somebody, and it'll be in quotes, but the majority of them are my own studies to put in there for you. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go ahead and pray. And we'll be uh, wrapped up here for this one for today. Father, thank you so much. 
especially as we have an opportunity to come and receive at your table. Oh God, we ask for great faith. Open our minds and our hearts to the word of God that we can come receive this word applied to us. I ask for my brothers and sisters who are in the wrestling spot and trying to pray and understand these things, please give grace and mercy and help to them. We bless the body of Christ and all that are faithfully trying to serve you. And we ask for your grace as we move forward the rest of our day. Amen. Thank you so much.